what are some of the goals that you have in looking at a piece of literature like Asada's autobiography? So we chose Asada specifically um, thinking about the power of narrative and how healing and transformative it, it can be to tell your story, um, but also the value in building community and movements through storytelling, right, which is an indigenous practice worldwide um, that often gets really disregarded in schools traditionally. And you've had these same students over now, this is the third year? Yeah, so some of them, this is, for the juniors, this is my third year with them, and for the seniors, this is my fourth year with them. And what are you seeing over the course of three years in their ability to engage, not just literature in general, but deeper concepts of social justice, their own sense of empowerment? Like, what are you seeing over time with these students? I think over time that they're able to take these really complex ideas that in reality they get. So as ninth graders, they understand oppression, right? It's their lived experience and all that they're doing is getting a sociological term to name their experience. So they understand it. But there's a way in which I don't think in the first year that all young people really internalize those ideas um, and own them and really feel compelled or a sense of agency to engage with and transform those things in, a, in the way that they do three years in. Right? So what I'm really seeing three years in, it's funny because as ninth graders, I taught a tiny excerpt of Asada. And as 10th graders, I gave them another excerpt from Asada. Right now they're juniors and they're reading all of it. And the, the way that they're able to engage and the way they're able to analyze is so profoundly different than they were as ninth graders. Like they're so, like you look around and they're all reading and they're all into it. Um, and Asada's dope, but the reality is for ninth graders in their first week, like that just doesn't happen in the same ways. Um, I think also because they, they're able to hold each other to a standard now. So there's this way I think that I'm seeing them not only feel empowered, but seeing their peers as agents of change in their own community. And so when they start to fall off, I see a lot of like, well, you got this, like, let's do this. Like, we, we have this responsibility. And I think that that sort of collective responsibility takes years to build. Mm -hmm. And as a teacher, how much control do you have over selecting books like this? And do you get any kind of pushback when you're choosing explicitly social justice curriculum? At this point, I'm the only returning English teacher to this school, and I'm also the veteran English teacher on this campus, which gives me like a certain ability to be able to choose texts. I also think that what I have is like the lexicon and the ability to defend the texts that I'm teaching, right? Because they meet all of the standards that young people are expected to meet, and in a lot of ways, they supersede those standards, right? That we are reading college-level texts, um, and so it's really hard, I think, for administrators right, to sit down with the teacher and say, like, why are you teaching, like, a college-level text in 10th and 11th grade? Like, they have no real basis um, for why I shouldn't be teaching these things. Mm -hmm. And I also don't, I think the other thing that I do, particularly more so because I teach 9th and 10th grade, is that I don't always teach explicitly um, social justice texts. I think it's really important for young people to be able to identify social justice ideas in texts that are not explicitly social justice, right? That they be able to identify different forms of oppression in like, dystopian novels, right? And that that gives them a really keen ability to be able to identify those types of oppressive conditions in their lived experiences in a way that, right, Asada is really explicit. Asada is like, yo, this is f***ed up, like this is oppressive. And I think that that's important. And I think it's equally important for young people to be able to, to find that evidence for themselves um, when the author isn't telling them that, mm -hmm. right? So I think a lot of teachers get sort of stuck when administrators say, like, oh, you can't teach this book. And they start to feel like, if I can't teach an explicitly social justice book, then I can't do social justice work, mm -hmm. which is like such a false dichotomy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are your students showing in terms of their learning that allows you to teach what you teach? Yeah, so I think that like young people are really engaged and they're doing so much work and they're writing like really profound. So we ended last year and they wrote essays on the alchemist and they wrote like 20 page essays, right? And they're 10th graders and you know, 25 page essays and they were really excited. And I think that when administrators see that level of work, 
coming from young people, not even just the level of work, but the level of, of enthusiasm and sort of responsibility to the work, that it makes it much harder for them to argue with the teacher about what it is that they're doing. Mm -hmm. right, so my administrator t came to me the other day and he was like, I was really mad because kids are running in the hallway. And when I told them to stop, they were like, no, we have Ms. Shreem's class. And they kept running. Um, and so for me, that's just an indicator, like young people are running to class, they're excited to be here. And part of that is relationships. Um, but a lot of that is that they feel like the work that we're doing is important enough to run to. And when administrators see that, like, you know, they lose the sort of ground to challenge what it is that I'm doing. Following up a little bit, I mean, one of the things I noticed in the class was, as you were saying, like the complete engagement of students and a buzz in the room, as opposed to the traditional idea of if students are on task, then they're quiet, they're sitting in rows, they're paying attention, there's no noise, and then the opposite stereotype that that never happens in inner city schools, that there's this constant disruption and rebellion, and yet here, not once did I see anybody in any way pushing back being disrespectful to anybody else. There was a level of noise and activity, but it was all the buzz of the learning. So that's just an interesting observation. I mean, anything you would say about that? Like how that whole concept of behavior management that's always being talked about in education, like what does that look like differently in a social justice classroom? Wow, so it's interesting because I think I actually view this differently than a lot of social justice okay. teachers. And it's, I feel like I have a lot of mentors with really different, differing ideas on this, and I think mine falls somewhere in the middle. Okay. So this is three years in the making, right? So there's like a level of trust and like noise and sort of comfort with movement around the room and like being able to shout things out that I think we've like built and earned together. And I think, like, right, it's not either or. So you can have really quiet classrooms that are so social justice oriented. And you also have a lot of loud classrooms and a lot of like really like wannabe social justice teachers who like allow young people to act a crazy hot mess and yell and throw things and like create really unsafe environments for children. Mm -hmm. um, right, so I think it's really about like taking the time to build a space right, that is respectful always, whether it's quiet or whether it's loud, right? And those types of things are built over time, right? This is, right, it's really easy for it to look like that because they've also been together for three years, right? But they weren't like that year one either. So what did you do to help build that sense of community from when they were originally ninth graders? I yelled a lot. Um, <laughs> part of it is just time, right? Like there's, there's no substitute for time. Um, and the other thing is, you know, that everything that we do is about them getting to know themselves and getting to know each other. And so in the process of really learning and unlearning so much about who they are and really coming into who they are becoming um, and them sort of going through that process together, right? Like I often think about college and what it meant to find myself in college and the types of relationships that I built in college. Um, and I feel like for them, that's just happening earlier, right? That they're really growing and identifying who they are. And there's a closeness that you develop when the person next to you is struggling and grappling with that sort of same tension about who they want to be and what role they want to have in this world and, and how to make that work while still dealing with all the real conditions that they have to deal with on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. nice. What does it mean to you to be a social justice educator? How do you think about that? For me, being a social justice teacher is about like using the classroom um, as a means to disrupt and dismantle like the same systems of oppression that have like targeted my family for centuries and targeted my people for centuries and have caused so much unearned suffering um, to the lives of of my folks and other oppressed folks like sort of worldwide um, and to help young people really come to terms with like all of the trauma that we carry from from generations and generations like of a colonial threat an immediate colonial threat upon our bodies um, and to help them heal and find like sense of self and self-worth and self-love um, and a sense of agency to like join me in like the struggle to disrupt those systems that have been targeting our bodies forever.